Hi everyone, welcome to Bold Conjectures with Parish Chopra. Today I am with Jeff Lichman, who is a professor of molecular and cellular biology at Harvard University. He's interested in finding out how long-lasting memories are physically stored in the brain. We all remember scenes from our childhood vividly. Some of those scenes are decades old and yet we can recall them as if they happened just yesterday. We don't yet know how exactly uh, such high fidelity uh, images and experiences are stored uh, for such a long time in the brain but professor jeff lichman and his research group have become uh, have begun uncovering some of the answers so his research has required uh, to invent um, a number of techniques for mapping individual neurons and their connections in mammalian brains uh, such efforts have revealed a detailed map of brains of various animals uh, such as mice and uh, uh flies um the holy grain of uh, brain science uh, is to understand the human brain and uh, towards that professor jeff lichman and uh, his collaborators recently finished a project where they map uh, 1 mm cube of a uh, human brain tissue uh, using electron microscope at a nanometer resolution um this this progress is uh, uh phenomenal not just from a technical uh point of view but also for the number of things uh, it has revealed uh, which uh, we haven't uh, fully sort of understood so far so th- the project revealed a gold mine of 1.6 petabytes of data uh, which is sufficient to fill more than 3000 laptop hard drives uh, uh, and mind you this is just 1 mm cube of human brain which uh, is is extremely tiny i mean my rough calculations uh, say that probably it's less than 0.0001% of the entire brain so 1.6 petabytes of data for such a small piece of tissue is just truly staggering um, it just shows how enormously rich and complex human brain is so needless to say we have uh, a long way to go towards full understanding of the human brain but thanks to studies like uh, this one uh, uh, we are sort of Uh, answering um, a lot of sort of new questions and discovering many interesting things so that's what today we are going to discuss uh, uh we'll talk about what are what is the state of the art understanding of what we know about human brain structure and its connection map uh welcome uh, professor lichman thanks for doing this my pleasure happy to talk to you paris fantastic so i wanted to start uh, by touching upon your uh, motivation uh, for research that's on your home page of studying physical basis of long lasting experiences and memories so how did you get interested in this uh, question uh, my interest is uh something that i can trace back to when i was younger than you are uh, when i was uh, just beginning graduate school and i did my phd thesis and uh, my phd was on a part of the nervous system that i think almost no one would think is very interesting which is the connections between nerve cells in a part of the neck of a rat that drives saliva secretion uh, yeah. and i remember my mother asking me why in god's name <laughs> are you working on rat spit it just <laughs> seems like such a ridiculously odd thing to work on i mean were there diseases and i said no the reason it's interesting is that this is a very easy place to study the connections between nerve cells and uh that work showed me uh that the wiring diagram of this very unimportant at least for humans part of the nervous system of a rodent undergoes a really huge change in postnatal life in early life the wiring diagram of this little part of the nervous system changes and the change is mainly one of simplification interestingly uh so you know babies uh, slobber you know they drool a lot right. but yeah. adults usually don't and this is partly related to the fact that many of the connections are pruned away in early life and what you're left with is a much more functional um way of sleep, uh releasing saliva so that's what i studied and that got my mind thinking about this notion of wiring diagrams changing as animals grew up and i knew from looking at um my own children i was just beginning uh, a little bit after that i had my first child but my my brother already had a child that human babies don't know anything about the world and 
they they basically, uh, unlike most animals, they are really dependent on learning in order to become adult animals. And I I took what I knew, which was only one thing. I only knew about saliva in the rat. And I wondered whether that was a principle, maybe that it occurs throughout the nervous system, that early on the wiring diagram is complicated. And then through development, things are pruned away and you end up with adult wiring diagram. And that led me throughout my entire career to be asking and inquiring about changes in the nervous system's wiring diagram as we get older. And there's no animal where that's more relevant than the human being. In fact, I would say this is what sets us apart from other animals, is that we this window of change lasts much longer into life. And we start out knowing much less about the world than most other animals. You know, it right. takes a human a year to learn how to walk. There's no animal as backward <laughs> as a human being when it comes to, to that. And, and if a person ends up getting a driver's license, it's another 15 years after that. You know, a mouse only lives two years. And yet humans, it takes 16 years basically to get a driver's license, at least in the United States. And then people who go to college, they don't leave the nest until they're two or four, four more years after that, 18 or 20. And, um, you know, they don't have a job until another four or five years after that. And if you're in academia, you don't get tenure until you're like 50. You know, we have this very prolonged opportunity to learn about the world. So what is going on in our brains as we go from being know-nothing babies with all these wires to these very, very focused adults? Um, and I, I think that is what has uh, sort of driven all my interest in this subject. Right. Um, I, I think I want to take a tangent from here uh, and uh, uh, just build upon what you've said. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I mean, answering why questions in biology is always difficult, but I'm still going to ask them. Why do you think evolution sort of uh, stumbled upon this strategy for humans uh, versus for other animals where for some of the animals like giraffe and others, they just they're born and they know what to do in the world. Yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous advantage uh, to have your nervous system wired appropriately for behaviors that allow you to survive from the get-go. And indeed, if you look at the planet, there are no other animals that are what biologists would call obligate learners. That is, learning without learning, we cannot survive. Many other animals have built into their nervous systems from the get-go, all the information they need to survive. They don't have to go to school. They don't have to learn a language. They don't have to learn how to walk. These things are all sort of built in uh, to their wiring diagram. And it only was a sort of interesting experiment of nature, if you will, mm. uh, to allow that window of opportunity to learn to be expanded by doing something that actually seems very counterproductive, producing children that are helpless, <laughs> that can't survive without their parents or without protection. And, you know, young children are more than, I mean, they're totally helpless. They, a baby is totally, totally helpless for a very long period of time. Um, and the interesting feature of having this long period of openness to environmental learning is that the nervous system shapes itself to the world it finds itself in, which is very different from most animals where, you know, if you looked at a squirrel 10,000 years ago, its behavioral repertoire would be very similar to a squirrel today. And 100,000 years ago, if squirrels were around and probably something like them were, it would be very similar. You look at a human 100,000 years ago, we would be, we did exist, but our behavioral repertoire was entirely different. And that wasn't because of evolution or genetic uh, evolution, at least. It was cultural evolution. So we're the only animal that can do this. And by doing it, of course, we are much more adaptable than most other animals. And as the world changes and extinctions are a big problem, for humans, overpopulation is the biggest problem. You know, it's not that there aren't enough human beings in general. Right. So, I think it's a very successful strategy, but it required, 
you know, a leap of faith, basically. And evolution is the grand tinkerer. You know, if it didn't work out, yeah. there would be no humans. There'd just be very effective other kinds of animals. But, you know, it is not lost on me that our nearest relative is now the chimpanzee, yeah. which is quite a different animal than a human being. But there was in the history of the development of hominids, a whole bunch of animals that were quite similar to us, and they're all extinct. And I can only imagine there's one reason for that, and that's us. <laughs> Just a, <laughs> And I think the only reason chimpanzees and great apes are still alive is the kindness of some human beings to try to protect some of these animals, but they're barely hanging on. You know, we are really a terrible species for the other species. By virtue of our ability to adapt, there's no place we can't go and ruin the environments of other animals that can't adapt, basically. Right. So it's so interesting, uh, the point you're making, that likely the general architecture of having uh, like too many connections in the brain uh, and pruning them, uh, which leads to adaptation, is probably the sort of framework by which uh, human species generally seems to be very adaptable. Uh, I never thought that uh, what is known in neuroscience now that uh, the connections get pruned would actually be related to the such such sort of uh, dominance of humans. I think the connection is very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, one interesting point here is the reason I think this is because when I was young, this was the idea that it, it wasn't a theory. It was, I found that result. And then, you know, that is, it really does happen. Uh, and in thinking about it, alternative reasons for why humans might be special got pruned out of my brain. <laughs> so I'm left <laughs> with this absolute certainty about this uh, because all the other ideas don't exist anymore because of pruning. Now, this is so you can take that one of two ways. <laughs> yeah, very meta idea. But, but I, I am a product, as most older people are, a product of, their, of the world they grew up in. And so my points of view, my biases, my opinions are largely shaped by my experiences. I'm just very fortunate that my experiences were exactly the right experiences <laughs> to generate this idea. But, you know, <laughs> that's how I see it. But, of course, people who think about it differently probably see it in a different way. Right. So is it fair to say this uh, pruning sort of never stops because we never stop learning even in adulthood? I like to think that uh, humans continue to learn, uh, certainly. I'm not sure my children feel that about me, <laughs> <laughs> that they seem I might be stuck in, in my points of view. And I think you probably, from your own experience with older people, you probably feel that they're a little more set in their ways. Um, it, there's certainly nothing to equivalent to the massive amount of learning going on in young children. You know, where without going to school, they learn a language and they don't only learn a language, but they use the language to think you know, they, these things. There's just nothing like that for an adult to learn a language. It's hard work for a baby, for a young kid. It's, it's not hard work at all. So I think as we get older, probably more and more of our nervous system is based on uh, the experiences of the past. And this is the indelibility, basically, of long-term memory. It's why our memories are so persistent, is that once they're there and alternative ways of driving neurons have been pruned away, there's nothing that can happen to those wiring diagrams. And so they stably sit there. But there must be a residual amount of brain power for generating new ideas. Humans apparently into advanced old age, you know, in their 90s and older, can still learn new vocabulary words, for right. example. Quite remarkable. Yeah. Uh, so, And I don't think that's true of most other animals. There's a saying in English uh, that you can't teach old dogs new tricks, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that at some point they just won't learn anything new. And, uh, you know, I think that's not so true for humans. We can learn. But but you certainly get the sense of biases. And these biases are not just opinions. It's that our whole perceptive way of seeing the world is based on our previous experience. 
experiences. And so once you filter the world based on your expectations, it's very hard to change a person's point of view, as you see from political discourse of adults that, you know, they, people can see the same event in opposite ways. And there's no amount of rational discourse that's going to get to the truth because both sides are filtering the data through a very particular lens of their own experience. True. True. So I want to sort of set the base for discussing your paper, but I, I think maybe a few uh, basic concepts uh, talking about them and hearing your point of view f- for them will be helpful to set that base. So uh, I want to start with uh, just at a very broad level, um, uh, at a broad level, I mean, I, I would imagine brain has uh, cortex, which uh, we all see in the diagrams as that uh, wrinkled sheet that uh, looks i mean the wrinkled sheet that you see in the diagrams and then they are sort of subcortical structures like uh, hippocampus thalamus that are never usually seen in the diagram so wanted to understand from you what do you think uh, what makes cortex special uh, how is it different from other st- structures and particularly in also in context of humans versus non humans so uh, because i imagine cortex is what makes us special yeah uh- I should say, if if you look at high resolution at the cortical matter in a mouse, and you look at it in a human, and I asked you which of these two animals has the most magnificent brain in the history of life on the planet, and which is just a rodent, you would not be able to tell the difference. Um, In fact, if anything, you might think the mouse is more impressive because there's more synapses densely packed. Uh, It's just more cells, they're closer together. It's just there isn't as much of it. And I would say this may be part of the issue, but it can't be the whole issue because humans do not have the biggest cortex cortex in the planet. Whales do. Mm -hmm. And elephants have bigger brains uh, than humans as well. That To a first approximation, the size of the cortex scales with the size of the body. But among animals like us, uh, the the apes, the primates, um, our brains are bigger relative to our body size than other similar animals, which is kind of a, that that doesn't obviously cry out that we should be the master (laughs) species on the planet. We are by far the most successful mammal that's ever lived. I I think, you know, quantitatively, one could make that case at this point. So what is it uh, about cortex? I think maybe the key to cortex is that it's a learning machine. It's it's basically designed to store information and then recall it to allow behavior. And behavior is sort of formally defined here as sensory input that generates a motor or muscle muscular output. But that's what behavior is. You Something comes in, you see a red light, you're driving a car, and you put your foot on the brake pedal. That, that's a behavior. Uh, and yet you couldn't have genetically had a behavior to do that because red lights have only existed for 100 years or so. So it has to have been built into the nervous system. And it's probably, I would argue, through a wiring diagram change because that's all that's in there is wires that connect nerve cells. And humans just have a lot of excess of that kind of material, as evidenced by the fact that many parts of the brain are called, for neurosurgeons, they call them non-eloquent parts. That means that if a neurosurgeon has to remove a piece of brain, except for certain particular areas of cortex, most areas of cortex, they can take out chunks of brain the size of a mouse brain, and the patient is still the same, basically. (laughs) There's no obvious deficit, as shocking as that may seem. And, and you know, neuro, neurosurgeons say, yeah, it's fine. It's non-eloquent cortex. And, I, and I, when I look at these pieces of cortex that we've been studying and see the millions of synapses, yeah. and, you know, I think like this is crazy. It, it is being used. It's just everything is so overlapping and there's so much redundancy and such complexity to these networks that you can disrupt a part of it without bringing the whole thing down in most parts of the brain. Right. So you did touch upon, uh, say, uh, elephants uh, or whales cortex might is is bigger than humans. Oh, by far. uh, uh, So do we have uh, uh, in the community a sense of why they're 
not sort of more intelligent or generally sort of more adaptive than humans if there's just more learning material base in them than us. Yeah, I think the window of uh, changing the brain based on experience is more rapidly closed in those animals. The offspring have to be self-sufficient at a much younger age. They need more brain cells because they have more body cells. They have more muscle fibers. It means they need more neurons to activate the muscle fibers. And then you need more neurons to activate the neurons that are activating muscle fibers. So the whole brain gets bigger. They also have more sense organs because their skin is larger. So they have to have more sensory neurons. So the, their brain has to be larger because they have a bigger body. But the window of changing the brain doesn't have to be longer. And those are long-lived animals. But but they are still, they mature far quicker uh, mm. than human beings. Um, so I don't know what the age of puberty is in an elephant. I should check that. But I suspect it's, it's earlier than 13 or 14 years of age. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what, uh, coming back to your point, that for like animals of our body mass, we have the highest, uh, the largest sort of brain. And I would imagine that roughly says that the proportion of neurons maybe dedicated to learning might be highest for humans versus yes. just input output neurons and supporting structures. Yes. And there's another theory. It's, it's kind of interesting. When you look at a baby chimpanzee and you look at a human being, you find marked parallels in the appearance of young primates. And humans sort of are stuck in this developmental stage, and we don't become adult apes, if you will, as quickly, if, if at all. Well, I can tell you now, as I'm reaching advanced age, that this is a little gross, but you know, hairs are growing out of my ears, for example. I'm getting a little hair on my back. You know, I am apifying, if you will. <laughs> I am going in that direction, but it's very slow compared to uh, the way this would happen in a chimpanzee. Wow. I mean, so that's called neoteny, this sort okay. of um, persistence of juvenile traits. Uh, human, adult humans play. You know, many, my dog uh, is now 11 years old and she plays only begrudgingly. She's where she, as a puppy, played all the time. But adult humans play. You know, they, they play sports, they play for fun. Um, and that's a sign of, of, of us being sort of still in a ch our childhood, our adolescence, neurologically speaking, right. compared to other animals. So you said the theory is called neo... neo no, neoteny. N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. Neoteny. Very interesting. It seems like evolution has sort of like dialed a big sort of button, uh, which says the pace of uh, growing an adult could be slower. And maybe that's what resulted in all the adaptability. Yes, I think that's the idea. Wow, that's okay. Okay, so uh, again, coming to cortex uh, and the brain in general, most people know about neurons, uh, but uh, they're not the majority of cells found uh, in the brain. Uh, glial cells are. So could you talk about what are these cells and uh, their function and generally why they're not more popular? Why don't more people <laughs> know about uh, glial cells? I think there are biologists who really spend their whole career studying these non-neuronal cells in the brain that used to get the title, glia sort of means glue, that they were just there to stick the neurons together or fill empty spaces, or they were supporting cells, sort of like supporting actors in a, in a play. They're just sort of on the sidelines. They're not very important. There are a lot of people who would dispute that view of glia and say that, that they are absolutely essential players. Uh, it's just that their job is a little different from the job of neurons. Uh, and they're, they come in a number of varieties and they play different roles depending on which variety you're talking about. So perhaps the one that is most uh, well-known, although not by this name, is the oligodendrocyte, a really complicated name. But these are neurons that make a material called myelin. And you've probably heard of the word myelin. Myelin is uh, the material that wraps around one of the nerve cell processes that leave neurons. It's called the axon 
that's the outflow of a neuron. A neuron receives information on its dendrites and sends information to other cells out its axon. And to make that electrical signal pass very quickly down an axon, the axon is insulated with something called myelin, which is wraps of a membrane that is made by the oligodendrocyte. It's an important cell because when the myelin is attacked, uh, often in an autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis, uh, that's a you know devastating, difficult disease for people who have multiple sclerosis, MS, sometimes called. Uh, and oligodendrocytes make the myelin in the central nervous system. And that turns out to be the cell that is most populated in the, in the cortical sample we had. There were more oligodendrocytes than neurons or than any other type of glia. So that, mm. that's one type of glial cell. Um, another type of glial cell uh, is the astrocyte. Uh, the astrocyte has that name because it has lots of branches coming out of it. Uh, and people sometimes think they look like stars. So a cell, site, astro, you know, a bunch of star-like branches. These are extraordinarily complicated looking cells when you actually reconstruct them in their full glory. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about how we see the shapes of every single one of these cells. And they do fill up space where neurons aren't. And in certain cases, they seem to be doing important things like um, covering a particular connection between one nerve cell's axon and another cell's dendrite. Okay. They'll protect that site. But they're most famous for the fact that if there's brain injury, they divide and they make a scar. They sort of fill the space with what's called a glial scar, which is probably very useful uh, for keeping the brain from caving in on itself, for example. Uh, these glial scars, however, also potentially prevent axons from growing. So a glial scar in the spinal cord, for example, some people have thought may be a barrier for axons to regenerate and why spinal cord injury is often devastating because axons won't grow. I'm not sure that is the reason axons okay. don't grow, but, but that's one idea. A third type of glial cell is the microglia, which is actually an immunological cell. It's a cell that's surveilling the territory to see if there's an infection or other sorts of problems where it can chew up and eat uh, the damage. So in diseases like Alzheimer's, where there are these big plaques, the plaque uh, is often surrounded by microglia that are chewing away at it as quickly as possible, but uh, they can't keep up basically with plaque formation. So right. those are, there's a few other types of glial cells, right. but those are the three big. Yeah. Cells. So, uh, I mean, these cells. Uh, I mean, from your paper, it seems they are like 75 percent or so of the all cell types, and uh, they being so close to neurons. Uh, I'm I'm curious. Uh, in like in in millions of years of evolution, do, do you imagine they would have no role to play in like the communication that's happening, the electrical communication or other types? Because it always seems uh, the neuron spiking rate, action potency, everything is about neurons. But oligodendrocyte seems literally to be just next to neurons. So do they play no role at all in our intelligence and generally the yeah. communication? I mean, there is a, I'm not sure it's apocryphal, but there was an analysis of a piece of Albert Einstein's brain. Okay. Many people think he is the smartest human being who ever lived. He certainly was very smart, no question. Uh, and the claim was made that there were more astrocytes in his brain <laughs> than in most people's brains. So that, that's one interesting factoid. I don't, you know, correlation doesn't mean causation or anything, but, but that has been said. I think one of the things is that um, neurotransmission, which is how one nerve cell talks to another by releasing a chemical, a neurotransmitter, that binds to a receptor on a target cell. Uh, after the binding of the neurotransmitter, the target cell is activated, and then the neurotransmitter is free to leave. And if it just keeps building up, it, it could bind to other receptors. And one interesting role of astrocytes is to take up this glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter, the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Most of the talking that's trying to activate cells is by glutamate. 
And astrocytes are playing a role in keeping the, the levels of glutamate low. And that's really, really important. Um, so it, it may be a caretaking role, but without it, the whole thing would fall apart. So if there are more such cells, maybe the glutamate levels are lower. So you're more sensitive to small stimuli, who knows? But, I, and I'm just waving my hands here. I, I really don't know what role glial cells have in intelligence, but they certainly are an essential ingredient in the ecosystem, if you will, of cells that live in your brain. And those cells are living. I think this is a hard thing for people to understand. We think of us as being alive, but we don't think of our cells as being alive, but our cells themselves don't, they're not cognizant of the fact they're a small cog in the giant brain. They're just living in this very weird pond, trying right. to get along with their neighbors and trying to survive basically. And the glial cells play some roles and the neurons play other. And I don't think anyone thinks they're more important than anyone else. I think they all right. feel they're very important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, I mean, that's one of the um, very interesting things I've come about to realizing that the self in general exists on so many levels in biology, where for our cells, uh, our body is the entire universe. And uh, they simply, um, they simply sort of find uh, so-called collaboration uh, helpful, but in a very selfish sense that they'll yes. be safer within our body versus outside of it. I mean, I would go a step further here, and I, this may seem like a stretch a bit, but ultimately, the only thing that is driving everything you do as a human being is your nerve cells uh, and their relations, let's say, with glia, getting along with glia, let's say. Um, but nerve cells themselves have a will to survive, just like a human being. That is they will grow towards when they are forming the wiring diagram of the brain, they are growing towards places where they get some positive feedback, perhaps nutrients, trophic factors from the targets they innervate. And they are avoiding things that they find unpleasant, all related to their own survival. And uh, they, so they need food basically to survive. They need oxygen, they need glucose, and they need trophic factors and, and their behavior the behavior of cells now, not the behavior of the brain, but the behavior of individual cells is very much driving probably the way the brain develops. It is not surprising to me then that when a human being sees a sweet treat and goes towards it, it's basically fulfilling the requirements of the cells inside the brain that want you to get glucose into the brain that that it's it's sort of like the behavior of a country. Think of the brain as like a, a country, the United States or India. And and the thing a country does to protect itself is it it protects its borders, it may take over territory. It's all doing this for the survival of the country. And we'd say, well, that's interesting because a country is not a living thing. It's doing it because it's made up of people who want that. And if you can understand that the behavior of a country will mimic the behavior of the population of people in the country, it's not hard to imagine that the behavior of a brain will mimic the behavior, the will, basically, of the individual cells inside the brain. Right. Yeah. I and mean, that's such a fascinating uh, line of thought. And it opens up all sorts of questions. I mean, I mean especially about consciousness, but uh, probably will not. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, we, we won't do justice to that question. <laughs> yeah, here. So I'll get not. back to, uh, again, getting closer to your study, just a last background setting before we talk about uh, the, the study that you did. So again, uh, cortex, um, now, as I understand, there's six layers to it. Um, it's the, sort of like columnar structure, six different layers. So can you, maybe I'm, I'm not fully sort of... Uh, uh, understood this, but can you talk about structure of cortex and why people talk about it as six layers? Yeah. So the neocortex, the newest okay. cortex in our brain has got six layers and the layers are not columns. They're horizontal layers parallel to the surface of the brain. Uh, the columns are information that flows from the most superficial layer inward and the one and in information that flows from inner layers to the outer layers, both more superficial and the deeper layers. But that six layer structure 
is sometimes called the gray matter mm -hmm. where the nerve cells are. And then the information that that little part of the brain wants to send elsewhere then leaves through axons, myelinated axons that go deeper than layer six and form the white matter. And so the white matter both sends myelinated axons into brain regions that have layers and also takes information from one region and brings it to another. So this six layer cortex is new in the history of life on the planet. Uh, it's seen mostly in mammals. Uh, no, no, I don't think any of the other terrestrial vertebrates have six layer cortex. So, but it's not just in humans. And so I th think one has to think about that as a design that really worked well. And it was a form of duplication because there's older cortex called archicortex, like the hippocampus, which has three layers. Okay. And three layer cortex is found in turtle, for example. There are places where there's three layer cortex. So, uh, I think six-layer cortex is just a doubling of whatever the three-layer cortex was. It, it just reduplicated itself. So it's a double-layered system, but it clearly is around in animals that are much more, I would say, le less dependent on learning than we are. Although perhaps still, obviously, all mammals do learn. All mammals play as children, as, as young animals. So all mammals are doing this kind of stuff. But it's not sufficient to explain what's special about humans, as we've already talked about. Maybe it's some developmental uh, timing issue. The six-layer cortex, uh, there's two kinds of focus on it. One is sort of what is the canonical circuitry that relates the cells of the various layers. And, and many of my colleagues who are cortical fo focused on the cortex per se are very interested in the local neuronal circuits, uh, just learning what cell types are in the various layers and how they're interconnected. I am uh, a little bit of an outlier in my thinking about cortex because I think this is the brain we're born with. But, it, but as I said, six-layer cortex is found in mice. So it's, it's that we've used it in a different way, that it is a learning machine, and we've just taken advantage of that and I'm not sure that really depends on it being a six-layered cortex. Right. I think it depends on this long window of opportunity that you just don't see in other right. animals. So, so, so I, I'm not personally that interested in the details of every last sort of canonical wire. I'm more interested in the wiring that came about through experience, which may be less concerned about which particular layer is which particular layer right so um so i are you saying layers per se uh, i mean they are sort of labels but maybe you don't want to put too much emphasis on which layer is help. doing what yeah i mean one interesting thing we did in this paper is we labeled through three-dimensional rendering with the help of our colleagues at google uh, every cell in this cortex. And if you label all the cells and just render them, it's, it, you don't see any layers. But if you then go in and color code the cells by their size, just by the size of the cell body where the nucleus is, then these layers just pop out and you can't miss them. And it's just, you know, some layers have big cells, some layers have small cells. The top layer have very few cells, mainly wires up there in the layer one. So you see these beautiful laminated structure in, in brain just by looking at size of cells. So it's not like they're not there, but what their role is when you're learning something, maybe it's sort of an, uh, this learning has co-opted this kind of brain tissue to do what it wants to do. And you may know about this kind of plasticity in brains that, you know, people who are blind from birth, uh, some of their auditory circuitry will take over the visual yeah. circuit. And, and it won't, there's no problem in that. Uh, children who have surgery and lose their cerebellum, let's say, because of a tumor at a very young age, which would be devastating in an adult without a cerebellum. This is not cerebral cortex. You can't balance. Right. Uh, those children 
learn to balance perfectly well without a cerebellum, almost certainly because oh. they've co-opted cortex to do something it, it was not designed to do, but it doesn't matter. I think this is the adaptability of cortex and why humans have leveraged this for such success. It, we can do whatever we want. We can keep making new tools, as you probably know, you know, the behavioral repertoire you use your thumbs to talk on your cell phone, let's say. Yeah. That didn't exist when I was a kid. There was no one in the world who was doing that. And now everybody's doing that, except right. old people like me. I mean, it it seems uh, this like neocortex uh, is such a general piece of architecture that can perhaps be put to learn in a variety of contexts. Um um is is it coming back to again why i mean i'm also sort of relating it to the whole drive of people to create uh, artificial general intelligence wherein they want uh, same architecture to be very uh, uh, very adaptable in what it ends up learning uh, and i think here we have this neocortex uh, you don't have cerebellum no problem you don't have vision no problem so I so at a high level uh, again coming back to the point you were making do you think it's a function of having a longer window of where pruning is happening and so on i mean what is the lesson sort of people who are working in artificial intelligence for example should take from this field yeah so i think people who work in artificial intelligence have paid a lot of attention people like jan lacun paid a lot of attention to the way information is processed in brains, uh, where you build more complicated percepts by attaching less complicated ones, uh, you know, dots yeah. connected to make lines, connected to make shapes, eventually to make faces, and that's how you build face recognition, that that's how machine learning does the same thing. The difference, I think, between machine learning uh, algorithms is that there is a weighting of connections in a in a convolutional neural net, yeah. but the weighting never goes to zero permanently. Right. Uh, and, and training is intensely inefficient. Uh, it's not one shot learning. There's we have to train our algorithms a lot more than you'd have to train a human being to do the same task. So there are some secrets that are not fully understood about neocortex. And, and it's probably related to a very fundamental feature of reverberation uh, in, in cortex that, and cortex perhaps with subcortical structures that allow brains to hold on to an idea and train itself, even with one shot experience, the idea resonates in the brain as if it's playing it over and over and over again. And that builds that sort of automatically turns it into multi-shot learning. I, I don't, I'm saying this as, because I think that's what's happening, but you can see it in human beings that, you know, if I, do you have perfect pitch, for example, you know what perfect pitch is? Yeah, I know. Do, do you, I, I don't have it. You do not have it. No. Right? And yet if I play a pitch for you now and then wait 10 seconds and play you two or three pitches that are similar to it, you can remember exactly which pitch it is. You yeah. do have perfect pitch. You just don't consolidate. It. So, <laughs> okay. so humans do have a reverberation circuit yeah. that allows you to hold on to information and play it over and over again. And why humans, most humans can't turn that into a long-term memory when it comes to pitch is, is interesting. We can't, can't, most of us can't consolidate it. But if you talk to someone with perfect pitch, what they'll tell you is what they remember is that, yes, that was an A sharp. And they remember the word A sharp. <laughs> and so the next time they hear those things, they remember which one is the A sharp. You know, it's because they could link the sound to some other part of the brain that stably stores information. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Long, long way to go before we reveal all the secrets of neocortex. Uh, so, on that note, coming to uh, your uh, uh, project where you mapped uh, human. Uh, cortex uh, tissue, one millimeter cube uh, at a nanometer resolution. So can you talk more about it? What, what exactly did you do? What were the steps and uh, why did you do it? Um, yeah, sure. I, I'm trying to think how to 
get started on explaining why and how we did this. We we have been developing approaches to allow us to trace out all the nerve cell connections in brain samples. And this is a young field in neuroscience, and it it's called connectomics. Uh, it's sort of a play on the word genomics. At least the first time we used that term, we were we were sort of joking. I mean, we, we didn't take it very seriously, but the word has stuck. Uh, and connectomics is sort of a mapping of all the wires, just as genomics is a mapping of all the nucleotide sequences in DNA. Um, and the techniques we developed potentially could scale if we could get fast enough machines to take the pictures, and if we could get enough compute power to allow machines to do the tracing. Because humans can do this task. It's just, even though a cubic millimeter seems ridiculously small, it's like the head of a pin, you know, it's yeah. not, not much. It, it's got, as you pointed out, 1,400 terabytes of wiring data in there. Yeah. And you, can't, you just can't find enough human beings to trace out something that much. So you need machine learning. And so it was a, a lucky coincidence of technologies that all became sort of possible at about the same time. And one was uh, that we had developed a way we could cut a brain into very, very thin sections. Uh, these are 30 nanometer thick sections. That's a thousandth as thick as a human hair. So they're very, very thin. You might think, why do you have to cut them so thin? And it's because we're tracing wires that are themselves just 100 nanometers wide sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have thicker samples, the wires in each section will be on top of each other and it's hard to trace them. It's like a bowl of spaghetti. If you could just slice it thin enough, you could trace every single spaghetti pasta strand through the whole ball. That's basically why we cut very thin. So we could cut the brain thin. And then uh, a company, uh, Zeiss, in Germany, built a multi-beam scanning electron microscope that allowed us to scan and image these brains much faster than we could before. And we were starting to accumulate this data. And then a colleague of mine from Google uh, called and said that they were, you know, looking around for big projects and did we have any? And as I, we were beginning to get this data in, I realized this is, this, you know, it's like Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> we knew we, we, it was nothing we could do with this data. We, we couldn't store it even. We didn't have barely enough room to store the whole data set. And Google, uh, especially Varen Jane's group, which is really a fantastic group of scientists, and he is himself, uh, you know, really smart and careful thinker. Um, I think that company and that group at, in that company are looking for projects that are difficult on purpose. They don't want to do anything easy. They don't want to do things that are hard. I think partly because that's how the company keeps being competitive by doing things that are impossible before they do them. So he was interested and they set to work on this huge data set and segmented out every single nerve cell process and identified every synapse all by machine learning techniques. We gave them training data, but the heavy lifting in terms of the compute and in building those algorithms was at Google. And um, yeah, the result is fantastic and it's online. You know, anybody wants to can go look at this petascale if you've ever, never looked at a data set that has 1,400 terabytes before, now you can do that. And it's like Google Earth, except it's not just the surface of the Earth. <laughs> you, know, you can go down through all the layers of the cortex uh, from the top to the bottom. Yeah, I've been, I've been looking at that uh, beautiful images you have yeah. all day long. Uh, it's, I mean, I had that cartoon picture of neuron in mind, but uh, when you look at well, the actual morphology, uh, it's just so different. Yeah, did you try out the neuroglans yes, or link where you can just I, I was click doing on that. cells? Yes. Yeah, it's I was just, just exploring. It's, it's just so much of uh, 
different dimensions you can go within those images and data and uh, it was fascinating really absolutely uh, truly fascinating uh, uh, data and visualizations so just to recap what you did you took like a 1 mm cube of uh, tissue you made uh, thousands of uh, tiny slices and tiny you mean on the nanometer scale and you scanned uh, them using electron microscope and sort of used algorithms to stitch them to produce like a 3d shape and structure of what that tissue is yeah the only slight thing i'd correct here is it wasn't a cube it was a cubic millimeter equivalent okay it was actually because the cortex is 3 millimeters long and we wanted to get all the layers it's it's like a thick piece of pizza sort of it's a sort of triangular thing okay. it's a cubic millimeter of volume but it but it's not cubic we would have loved to do a cube um and the future ones we're going to do are will be cubic uh, but this one was not cubic um and right. and so, and that's a little frustrating because these cells are so big that you trace them and you keep going and eventually they often reach the edge of your volume and it's very upsetting you know <laughs> that we don't but a cubic millimeter is just not a lot of uh, that amount of volume is just not a lot when it comes to brain cells and in humans the brain cells are relatively far apart so um right yeah it's uh yeah they they leave the volume often right so when you started um, when you sort of initiated the project what were you expecting to learn and what are the surprises that this data through that you were not aware of or actually nobody actually knew you know it's sort of like asking a person let's say and I, i'm not comparing myself to galileo but let's say galileo builds a telescope and you say what are you planning to learn <laughs> the telescope you say i don't know but uh, there are little things up there that i'd like to see bigger and then when you start looking suddenly it doesn't matter why you did it because now you've actually can see and i think a lot of human advance has come from building tools that provide new windows into the natural world new ways of looking uh and the microscope is a obviously a very famous example of this it just opened up a vast new dimension to reality that humans were not aware of until microscopes existed electron microscopes even more impressively that way um telescopes and radar every everything we do or basically is all these tools so my own personal per interest was exactly the interest i told you about in that silly little submandibular ganglion where rats were spinning which is to try to understand how information might be encoded in a part of the brain that is non eloquent and that for us was important i mean it was a piece of brain from a patient a living patient who had surgery to um deal with epilepsy and the epilepsy focus in that person was in their hippocampus which is a deep structure and to get access to the hippocampus the neurosurgeons had to make a hole in the overlying temporal cortex to find the site of the source of the epileptic seizures and then remove that but to get access they had to cut out a piece of brain and we were basically standing there with a beaker so when they cut it out we took it uh, it's anonymized so we don't know much about this patient other than it's a woman and she was in her 40s um and and they took a little piece the pathologist the neuropathologist took a little piece and said that this overlying brain looked normal so okay. there was nothing wrong with it and for me if it's non eloquent that is if the patient doesn't miss it it probably is storing information learned information as opposed to processing vision she's not blind or deaf or and she can move all her limbs so it wasn't primary motor cortex it was it was temporal lobe it was a place where probably memories are stored ultimately long term memories are stored in the cortex so i think i when i look at this little piece of tissue i'm looking at information stored i'm looking at memories although in what form is the big mystery all i see is what i see in a mouse brain <laughs> i just see a lot of wires and connections so we were not sure what to see i i was not optimistic that we would suddenly look at it and say aha here is the physical and stand 
differentiation of memory. Here is how knowledge is stored in the brain. And indeed, we did not find anything so straightforward. But we did see a bunch of interesting things. But I can't say I anticipated them. Okay. I, I would say an important thing about this kind of science is it's inductive, not deductive. It's not that we start with a hypothesis and we're using the brain to test whether we're right or wrong. We're collecting information from the data and hoping that that will generate a hypothesis as opposed to test it. And once you generate a hypothesis, then you can start thinking about ways of testing it. So yeah, among the many oddities we saw is that many of the cells that were more completely labeled, and that is cells sort of in the middle of the volume, among the many, many thousands of very weak connections that contacted them, there was a small subset of outlier connections that were very, very strong. And strong, I mean, that the axon would come and instead of touching one dendrite or one dendritic spine, as it's called, and making one synapse, the axon would come in and make 15 synapses on one target cell. And the axon might go on and then make one synapse on another target cell here or there. But for some reason, it had some special desire to make a massive numbers of synapses on one target cell. And what that would mean from the target cells perspective is that it would pay attention to that one input because when that action potential flies down the axon that's making all those synapses, all those synapses would release neurotransmitter synchronously, and that would summate and could bring the target cell to threshold. And so you would now have something that would give you an automatic response. And if you think about learning, you go from a phase of not knowing, where I ask you a question, you've never been in a car before, you don't know anything about red lights, you're driving along, you see a red light, you don't even know to put your foot on the brake. Then you learn that actually the red light is something you should stop at. So you, you see the red light and you say, oh, it's a red light. I've got to take my foot off the gas pedal. I've got to put it on my brake pedal. It's very cognitive. You're doing a lot of thinking. And then eventually it becomes entirely automatic. It's not cognitive anymore. You can be carrying on a conversation with someone sitting next to you, the red light comes on and your foot, unbeknownst to you, lifts off the gas yeah. pedal and puts itself on a brake pedal. At that point, you have sort of a reflex. You have an automatic pathway from red light, if you're in the context of in the, being in the driver's seat, to your foot to move it off the gas pedal and onto the brake pedal. I can imagine one way that might happen in this post-cognitive knowledge that you've now learned, automatic automatized, is that those connections are powerful enough that they just pass right through the system without a lot of cognition going on, without a lot of thinking. They're sort of subconscious. If you drive cars, you may know sometimes you get involved in a thought in your mind and you end up in your right where you were intending to go, but you were not co cognizant of even driving. You can do the, almost the whole task automatically. Uh, and I think that's probably because you can build very powerful circuits. So are these very powerful subset of wires we see the instantiation of knowledge in the brain right. that has now become automatized? So th that's one thing we found. We were not looking for, but it's really there. It's there. Right. It's it's easy enough to find. I think it. I mean, it'll be fascinating in theory to see at such resolution uh, before and after. Once a person has learned something, what changes have? But of course, um, I, I no, can't imagine. This yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to take it out, uh, right? So, hmm. and and also one of the things you mentioned in the paper is uh, this is obviously um, one person's uh, tissue, and um, I think you mentioned in the paper even for a simple neural network like uh, worms. Um, C. elegans, 40% of connections are variable between individuals. So how much uh, should we read into uh, one specific uh, sample that you have here? Yeah, so this is a really good point. And it's one of the reasons why I like to divide the questions from the canonical circuit question to the learning question. Because with learning, every single instantiation in every brain will be different. So you can't read much into it in that sense. But think of it this way. Um, a chess match uh, 
is a game that's very rule based, but virtually no two games are the same. Yeah. But people don't say it's impossible to understand chess because every game is different. You know, once you understand the meta logic by which experience instantiates information into the physical wiring diagram, my guess is it will all be the same. Hmm. You know, whether you speak English or some other language or many languages, my guess is the fundamental way that's wired will be the same, even though the details will be different. Uh, and so I'm not as concerned about this that for many people say it's a, a non-starter. You can't study something if every sample is different. And I say, well, obviously you can. <laughs> I mean, you, you could you could learn if you could watch one chess match from beginning to end, you probably would learn enough that you could understand every chess match, basically. Right. I mean, it's and the problem with EM yeah. is that you only get one time point. Uh, yeah. So you have to infer dynamism. Yeah. This, this sort of reminds me of uh, what archaeologists, if they find like a ancient writing sample and they just have one sample, I think uh, we are able to make enough progress, sometimes even decode just based off uh, that one sample and it's an internal logic. I, I guess you're trying to do yeah. something very similar. Exactly. And I, it is quite amazing how well, you know, we've decoded hieroglyphics uh, and the Rosetta Stone is a good example where there's just a little bit of overlap uh, in different languages. And that was enough to brace, basically break the code of what these languages were. Yeah. So that is the hope. That right. is the hope. Okay. Um, in your, again, uh, coming to your paper, um, it seems each neuron makes um, like thousands of connections with other neurons. I and mean, I've been reading the figure is 7,000 or so on an average, one neuron will uh, communicate and make connections. So uh, again, big question, how do neurons know who to connect to? Yeah. So, you know, our my view is based on original work that I did in the submandibular ganglion and then, it, and then work I did at the neuromuscular junction between spinal cord and muscle is that early on, they don't know. They mm. just wire up with everybody. It's what you're left with that ultimately tells you what's important. That the system is not designed to wire up perfectly from the get-go. And that's why babies can't do anything very well. <laughs> Nothing. They're really terrible, at, except maybe coughing and breathing, you know, things that probably wired up genetically. And in, there's a huge amount of interest in how nerve cells know what the right targets are. But I think, think in the cortex, that's not what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a system that's trying to be as all to all as possible right. to allow for any particular wiring diagram that you might need, depending on the experience you find. That, that's my view of, of how to think about it. Right. So I, I guess the more important question then is uh, the about the pruning mechanism. How do neurons know uh, which to strengthen, which connection to strengthen and which not to? So do we have an insight there? If it starts from all to L, how does this happen? Yeah, I mean, this is what most of my career has been about, is synapse elimination. That is what I really study. And that's what I studied in the salivary gland uh, innervation. And that's what I've been studying largely in systems that are easier to study, like uh, the connections between spinal cord neurons and muscle fibers. And we have another connectomics paper that's in bioarchive right now um, that is also about the rules that underlie who stays and who goes. You know, it, because it's it's two sides of the coin. It's not just who gets pruned, but the ones that stay get stronger, as evidenced perhaps by these very powerful connections in the cortex. But in muscle and in autonomic ganglia, as some neurons lose their connections, the one or several that stay elaborate many more new synapses on those target cells to more than compensate for the loss of the others. So this reorganization, this pruning is only half the story. It's also the making of connections that are strong. So in this other uh, paper, which was a 10-year study, <laughs> really a long one uh, to try to 
crack the code of synapse loss and pruning in muscle, uh, we saw that it's basically related to the order in which nerve cells are activated. That that nerve cells don't all act, get activated at the same time, but they get activated in a recruitment order. And you can think about this, you know, if, if I say something slightly funny, but it's not really funny, you might just turn your lip up a little bit. But if it's a little funnier, I might see your teeth. You know, you'll show your teeth because you're more happy of what I said. If, if it's even funnier, you might even go, huh. And if it's funnier still, you might go, ha, ha, ha. And if it's really funny, you'll fall off your chair <laughs> on the floor. It's not like that's each of those phenomena is a different circuit. It's that you're recruiting more of that happy circuit, if you will. And that recruitment order, I think, is a fundamental idea. That, that's what we think now. And in muscle, that's what we are seeing, is that there's an order to the connections and which ones survive the longest on the same target cell are, are ones that are next to each other in the order. That is, neurons whose firing patterns are very similar remain connected longer to the same target cells than neurons whose firing patterns are very different. So this is a whole different story, and it's a complicated story, but it is, uh, for us, a, a deep in, potentially a deep insight into the way in which uh, the pruning is decided. It's not, some people say, well, maybe the most active axon always wins, but every single axon wins some and loses some during the pruning. It's not that some axons are inferior. It's just which ones they win are related to who else is firing most similarly to them. So it's, it's more about similarity and dissimilarity than more versus less activity for generating a wiring diagram. And that's the new insight, if you will. Interesting. Um, okay. Since uh, we are coming to the end of the uh, time and conversation. I just have two more questions. Uh, uh, the the one of the questions I had was really this topic we brought. Uh, we were talking about initially the rat versus human brain. So most of the neuroscientists uh, spend their time, careers, and effort in studying the rodent's brain. Uh, but uh, obviously, I mean, the mice is not us, and vice versa. The size and the behavior is so different. So do you think it sort of justified this paradigm of studying a rodent's brain? Um, I mean, is it the right way to go forward when it comes to advances in neuroscience? Yeah, I mean, I, I've made this point a number of times that there is one unique species on the planet, uh, and that is us. And, and we are not unique because our heart is special or our lungs are special. Every organ we have is pretty much unremarkable. It's like the organs in other animals, with one exception, and that is our brain. And if you want to understand the human brain, you can't even look at a non-human primate. They're, they are not us. <laughs> There's nothing like us. And on, as far as we know, there is no other animal in the history of life on this planet that's had this remarkable ability to use information to pass on to its offspring to circumvent the you know darwinian evolution where it's all passed on by genes there's no other animal that does that so obviously we have to study human brains obviously no question in my mind it's just it's not trivial <laughs> to study human brains this way you know you need the complicity of patients and neurosurgeons and um you know, it's just hard to get brain tissue. Molecular brain studies can go on in humans by virtue of a lot of molecules survive death. But if you're interested in structure of wiring diagrams, it's easiest to use fresh tissue and there's, there's just not a lot of it. So, so there is a problem there. It is true, however, that all these other animals, these mammals, for example, go through the same phases that humans go through. They just pass through them much more quickly. So one approach is to look at the development of a mouse brain um, and see how does that change. Even though the mouse grows up in a month, when it's a very young animal, it's playful. It doesn't know as much as it does later on. It does accumulate information. Just the window is much shorter. So I have a feeling there's no 
fundamental reason one can't get insights into the human brain. And I would argue that, you know, we are now trying to get going on doing a whole mouse brain's wiring diagram. And that will be a thousand times bigger than um, a cubic millimeter. It's, it's a, instead of a petabyte, it'll be an exabyte. Oh. And a human brain will be a zettabyte. So we are not ready to do a human brain even if we could. But my argument would be maybe you would learn enough from doing small pieces of human brain, such as we're doing now, and doing at least one whole mouse brain at various developmental ages, that you'd basically understand what must be going on in the bigger brain of a human being that allows us to be special. That is my optimistic view of why we can use rodents. Great. So I'll just close with the last question and want you to take your opinion on uh, given the pace at which uh, technology is moving, when you think we'll have a full map of human brain. And I know it's speculation and wild speculation, but uh, do you expect that to happen, say, within this century or? Yeah, I think we will probably have a projectional map, uh, which is where axons are going from one part of the brain to another, but to have a synapse level reconstruction of a whole human brain, I'm not sure that question will seem as pressing as it does right now. Once we understand more about the way information is stored, you know, it would be a very, very particular brain, but it would, the, the lessons may come from smaller pieces of brains or even mouse brains and that you would no longer be interested in seeing every last part of it unless you really wanted to recreate all the memories, assuming one could do this, from that particular person. Uh, and, and it's sort of like genomics. You know, every genome is slightly different. Uh, and so once it was possible to do one, people wanted to do many just to see how they vary. And after a while, then the only value of doing more is to look for disease states or particular. There's no extra insight that comes from more. Uh, and it's possible that we will get pretty far along by just doing a whole mouse. To do a whole human being, as I said, is a zettabyte. So zettabyte is, you know, I don't know, it's roughly the digital content of the world in a year. You know, it's, it's an impossibly large yeah. number. We're talking about what a, a million petabytes or a billion terabytes. I mean, it's just, you know, I don't think anybody has the stomach for that right now. And also, there's the ethical question how would you yeah. get a brain preserved well enough that you could get the entire wiring diagram of a human brain? You'd, it would require the complicity of someone who, at the moment of death, uh, you know, is willing to get perfused with terrible chemicals to fix them. I, you know, there are people who would probably do that, but yeah, I, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Hmm. But, but so I'm setting my sights, given my gray hair, on something that could happen in my lifetime. And that's to get a whole mammalian brain, like a mouse's brain. And I think there would be a lot of deep insights uh, and, just from that. And when do you think that is, I mean, is that an active project or? Yes, that's active now. The NIH has just begun releasing uh, the idea that there'll be grants uh, even next summer that they'll begin to be looking for that will uh, uh, help them get started on this gigantic project. You know, an exabyte, it, it can't be done in a laboratory or right. it would have to be done by a consortium of labs yeah. or central facilities or distributed facilities. Yeah. I and mean, this, this reminds me of the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that scale project. Yeah, it is that scale. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Lichman. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Lots of interesting insights. I link to your paper and the other paper also uh, from the podcast. And hopefully we'll get to see uh, much more interesting sort of maps and many more detailed uh, images coming from your lab going forward. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paris. It was a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, bye bye. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.